I think music is one of those things where it's easy to look at it as this, it's either an all in game, like I'm all in or I can't do it. Like I'm not a real musician, whatever that means. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I'm so glad to have you here with me today. Reach out and say hi. Email me at feedback at contrabassconversations.com or find me on social media. I'd love to hear from you. And I know you're going to love today's episode with Seth Haynes. And Seth is a horn player. He's a digital marketing consultant and he's the author of Break Into the Scene, a musician's guide to making connections, creating opportunities, and launching a career. Sounds like a helpful book, doesn't it? And a lot of people think so because it's a number one best-selling book on Amazon in music business. How cool is that? And I've been following along with Seth for the last few months. He and I got in touch and when he interviewed me for his website, A Musician's Guide to Hustling. And we've been talking probably about once a week ever since and it's been so fun to watch him launch this book. And this is the real deal. This book will show you what to do, step-by-step, step, actionable steps on how you can make a career in music. I'm 40, and I'm finding all these things so useful. I've already used some of the techniques in his book. I should have known these techniques. Why did I know these techniques? They're so well laid out in this book. So we dig deep into the book, all sorts of other topics, just making opportunity to yourself in the world of music. It really ties into the entrepreneurial kind of episodes that I've been putting out over the last couple of months. So I hope you enjoy this. Seth's a great guy. Definitely pick up a copy of his book. I just did, and I'm so thrilled that this is out there, and I know I'm going to be recommending this book for a long time. Now, before we get going, I'd love to let you know just a little bit about our sponsor, Diderio Strings, and their Zyx Strings, which are multi-filament synthetic core strings. They're great pizzicato strings. They're great arco strings. They're used by artists like Barry Bales, Missy Raines, Mark Helias, Chris Jennings, Yuri Slavic. Did you know I had Yuri on the podcast several years ago? Great strings. Medium tension, light tension. You can get them with a C extension. They're American made. They're made in New York at the D'Addario factory. Check them out. And thank you, D'Addario, for sponsoring this podcast. Okay, here we go with this extremely fun conversation with Seth Haynes. All right, we are on the line with Seth Haynes, and I'm so thrilled to have you on the podcast, man. You had me on, on The Musician's Guide to Hustling a couple months ago, and it was such a thrill. So welcome, Seth. I'm happy to be here, Jason. Thanks so much for having me. It's great. And let, me, let, let everybody know who you are and what you do, a little bit about your background. Who is Seth Haynes? Who, uh, what, a, what a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so my name is Seth Haynes. I am a Philadelphia-based horn player. Uh, and I am also a digital marketing consultant, and I am also the author of a brand new book called Break Into the Scene, which just came out on October 10th. Mm -hmm. So that's the quick 10 second gist of who I am <laughs> and, and I'm, what I'm up to. And I'm, I'm guessing that you didn't start off music school with the thought of becoming a digital marketing consultant. Maybe you did, uh, or, or, <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe t take us through that that process. What what led right. you from playing horn in, in orchestra and band to doing what you do now? Sure. I mean, I guess probably the thing that I – how this all kind of happened is I – so I was I went to music school uh, at Temple University here in Philadelphia – so I was in school. I'm from South Carolina originally, and I basically about halfway through my time in music school, I just kind of realized that like this path that I feel like I'm on isn't what I want to be doing. And that's not to say that I don't want to be a horn player. I don't want to be a musician. It's just, you know, like I, I very much felt like I was on this path and moving in this direction of like trying to like you know, to go the audition route and things. And it just, it just didn't appeal to me. I did a few auditions. I did a few auditions throughout my time in school and it just, it wasn't the right fit. So, uh, something I've always been really, um, kind of 
big into is just following my interests and see where they take me. I, I don't really think that like, I think music is one of those things where it's easy to look at it as this, like it's either an all in game. Like I'm all in or I'm not, or I can't do it. Like I'm not a real musician, whatever Mm -hmm. that means, you know? So I remember I was very frustrated by like kind of my lack of understanding of how the business side of things work, because this is while I was in school was about the time when there were a lot of orchestras that were going bankrupt or on like labor strikes and things. I mean, I think that was when the Detroit symphony had their big um, like labor issue or negotiation issue. The Philadelphia orchestra was on strike at one point or there were labor negotiations or something. And there were, bankruptcies all over the place i think atlanta had problems at one point during this time like there was i mean i can't remember who all was but there was a lot of this going on and here i am like this music student just like oh my god like what am i getting myself into like these major organizations are like you know they were like there's all these things like like, how does an orchestra just go bankrupt like that's not something that like just like you like walk in the office one day and it's like oh crap we don't have any money left you know it's like it's like, how does that happen? So like, I got really interested in this kind of topic of like the business side of things. And so I remember I just started reading some books. And uh, one of them I read was um, like Who Killed Classical Music by Norman Lebrecht, um, or Brecht, Brecht, whatever it is. Um, I read that he has another book called The Maestro Myth. Yeah. And I read Drew McManus's blog, Adaptation, a lot. And I basically just... Um, I just wanted to understand like how this like I want to understand how like orchestras actually operated. And so I naturally kind of the natural progression of things. I started getting into marketing and startup, the kind of startup tech world. And I got really interested in all this stuff. And basically, I just read a ton of books. And eventually I started kind of doing my own projects. And so people would say like, people would, like, people would kind of, I'd be talking to people and they would be like, oh, do you know how to do like, you know, do you know how to set up an email list? And I didn't know how to do anything. And I was like, of course I do. I can do that for you. And I just said, yes, I just said yes to everything. So they're like, oh, do you know how to build a website? Of course I can build a website. Great. Do you know how to do Google AdWords? Absolutely. <laughs> of course I do. And so I literally just say yes to everything. And I still to this day operate under this kind of, um, I don't say yes to everything anymore. Uh, I would be buried in a lot of junk if I did that now. But like, but I would literally just like take on projects and agree to do things. And at first it was for free. They'd be like, oh, can you just like help me with this? And it's like, yeah, why not? I could take, I could take crack at it. And so I eventually started developing a skill set of like, you know, I was like, all right, now I know how to set up email lists. I know how to like create an email funnel. I know how to like build a website on like, you know, various platforms. I know how to, you know, just do these various things. So that was really how it started. Just me getting interested in things, reading about it, learning as much as I could, and then just finding a way to like implement what i was learning because yeah. that's the key to getting better at anything i mean any music any music student will tell you that implementation of a, of a skill is the only way to really truly like progress and grow i mean from my experience at least so that's how it initially got going and um not to like spend like 20 minutes talking about this but the the way that i really got going into what i'm currently doing where it's my full-time job that's my full-time business is i'm a digital marketing consultant, um, in addition to all the musical activities and other things I do. But I was actually working in a parking garage my senior, junior year at Temple, I think I started working in a parking garage. It was before my senior year. And really what happened is I was working at the Union League of Philadelphia garage, which is basically like a private social club in town. So it's where a lot of like Philadelphia's like quote unquote elite hang out. And so Basically, what happened is there was in the midst of all these other orchestra things going on, this is still going on around this time, uh, all these bankruptcy issues and labor negotiations and all this just stuff in the press about it. An organization in town, a Northern Orchestra in town, that they were having problems as well. And the new president of the organization happened to be a member of this of this club, the social club. And so 
and he's like a really big wig guy around there you know he like drives in he's like the guy that when he drives in like everybody runs over and is like oh how are you doing today sir like what can we do for you like you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and so yada 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 and so I just went up and started talking to him one day I was like I'm a valet I've got absolutely nothing to lose like I'm just gonna talk to this guy so and everybody was like what are you doing talking to that guy like you can't talk to him it's like why not like what do you mean I can't talk to him? He's like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gonna go park his car. Like, why not say hello? So I went up to him and I just said, like, I introduced myself and said, Hey, you know, I'm a musician. Uh, I've been reading about you in the paper. I've been following what you've been doing and kind of what's been going on. And I, I want to know more about the business side of things. You know, do you have any recommend? Do you have any like books or something you would recommend me check out or something I could learn about? And and he was like, you know what? Here's my card. Send me an email. So he gave me his card. I sent him an email. And he never responded. So I saw him like a week later and I said, hey, you know, I just want to say hello. You know, I, I, I sent you a note and he was like, oh, sorry about that. Send me another email. And this kind of went on. And he was like, call my office, call this person. So I kept doing it. And like, I couldn't get anybody to respond or anything. And this is, you know, at this point, it's like, he was probably like, I can't believe I gave that guy my car. Like, I want to like smack him every time I see him. But <laughs> like, I was like, why is this kid bothering me? So basically what ended up happening, though, is I, I I saw him in the garage one day. We kind of like I didn't say anything. He just kind of made eye contact and he came over and he's like, you know what? I've got half an hour next Thursday. Meet me at the jazz club next door and we'll have a drink. So I was like, yes. So I met him. He was on the phone almost the entire time we were there. Like he, we we talked for a serious like five minutes. He was on the phone the rest of the time. Like people kept calling him. One of those one of those guys is just constantly in demand. And he was and so he just told me. Go come to my office next Monday. This is on a Thursday, so come to my office on Monday morning and meet with the vice president of the organization. So I showed up at like eight a.m. or seven or nine a.m. whatever it was, and I sat down with the vice president and I walked out of there twenty minutes later with a paid internship in the marketing department. So that was how I got my first job in marketing was from. Uh, bugging a guy in a parking garage. So, <laughs> and so I worked there for a while. I did, um, I was, and I was always doing this stuff on the side. People would say, can you build a website? And I would say, yes. Can you do this? Yes. And eventually it got to the point where I had a, a lot of experience from working at this orchestra. And I, I ended up being the, the marketing manager there for, I worked there for about two and a half years. I eventually got let go from there, which is a whole other thing. But and I've been going. I've been working for myself full time ever since. So that's a uh, that's how that happened. <laughs> so much, so many great takeaways from that story. I, I love it. And, and what the, just the power of saying yes is something that kind of and, and being open to these opportunities. You see a guy sure. in a parking garage, and just having the having the guts or the courage or the just the. Thought. The shamelessness. The shamelessness. <laughs> yeah, but but that just having approaching people, being proactive. I mean, so so many great takeaways, and I I love that. It's not like I think as musicians, so often we're we're perfectionists in everything that we do, right? Absolutely. Like like we, absolutely, we don't want to release anything before it's perfect. Like we're going to play a recital. We're going to work on those pieces for months and months. And I love that right. you're talking about putting out, like someone comes up to you and says, do you know how to do an email list? The The reality is no, but the answer is yes. And give me, I know give, how give to me, figure it out. I That's know how to figure it out. And in my own life, I've had so many of those same experiences. Um, Going into that marketing job, what was, what was, maybe surprising or unexpected walking in the door there you've done some of that kind of work but now actually doing or I'm, i guess i'm referring to the in internship actually doing the internship what surprised right. you about getting set up in an environment like that yeah i mean the one thing that i would say that the biggest i would say this was, it was a it was a big surprise to me and it's something that i think a lot of musicians um, I won't say don't understand, but just don't have any experience with our concept of is just how much behind the scenes, how much time, energy, effort, resources, manpower it takes to run any kind of performing arts organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's probably the most surprising thing that I kind of took away from my time there is just understanding excuse me, just how 
challenging it actually is to run an orchestra. You know, I think it's really easy when you're when you're always on the artistic side of things to kind of um, say, you know, I think it's really easy to kind of like make a lot of assumptions about why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, and probably the most surprising thing for, for me was just really kind of like going into the sausage factory and seeing how it was actually made. You know, where like where does that paycheck come from? Like we literally show up, you know, it's like, and I think being a musician is just like the most like unbelievably privileged thing you can do. Like we literally get paid to like show up with a piece of wood with like strings attached to it and like strum on them in a, <laughs> in a pattern or like I put a horn. It's literally a piece of metal that's like beat into a circle by like a hammer somewhere. <laughs> and like I get paid to play this thing. Like that's crazy. But like, like what a cool thing. And so the thing that I think a lot of people um, don't quite get is just how much time, energy and things that goes into that. I mean, like, I mean, like God bless people that work in fundraising, for example. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's like, if you want to like really get into like the weeds of like how to be valuable to an organization that you are working for, if you're an orchestral musician or someone that works for a nonprofit or works with a nonprofit as, as like a hired gun, if you want to be tremendously valuable, talk to the people on the other side of the organization and say, how can I help? Mm -hmm. What can I do to make your job easier? There will be a million things that you would never expect that you could do to bring unbelievable value to the organization that you're working with or for, but also um, how that could you know, potentially you know, turn into more opportunities for yourself mm -hmm. as, a, as a great kind of takeaway that I saw a lot of musicians, the musicians that get it, like, they get a lot more opportunities and they're the first people, they're the first ones that they think of when they're like, we need someone to come to this donor party and just like, you know, play for half an hour with a, with a quintet or a jazz trio or whatever it is. So kind of seeing like the factory behind these organizations is really, really fascinating. And I highly encourage anybody that's out there that does this kind of work ever where you're performing to, get to know the people on the other side of the curtain and just say like, Hey, thanks so much for what you're doing. Like I may not, even if you don't understand all of the, like the way like the gears turn, like just be like, Hey, I know that you've got a really tough job. And like, I just, I really appreciate the work you guys are doing. If I can ever be of help, like if I can like help with anything, just let me know. That could be as simple as standing in the lobby before a concert and just greeting people as they come in, like, and just wearing like, a musician badge or something or and just saying hello or going to the donor party intermission or after the dinner or something. I mean, anything like that. I mean, I would really recommend people do that because you'll be very surprised at how quickly you become their go-to person when they need something like help like that. Because the reality is, you know, playing is only one part of being a musician, right? Yeah. So, and I think that would, I think that would be something that, that I took away a lot from that experience and that I think other people could um, probably learn from, you know, like acknowledging, acknowledging that there's a lot more to it and just engaging in that other side of it a little bit more. Well, I, I love the, the, the two, the two, uh, Keywords that I just heard you you as as, as you're describing that like showing some appreciation. I appreciate what you're doing, man. Absolutely. Is that is that a job that that is a can be a thankless job? Those behind the scenes jobs. And then how can I help? If if you ask anybody yeah. one of those things, there are ways you can help. Just like you said, it was fascinating. Oh my gosh, my, my, there are tons. Oh man, my my wife worked early on in my career. My wife was working behind the scenes for the Elgin Symphony. She was a okay. devel development assistant and I was playing in the Elgin Symphony. It was fascinating yep. to see both sides of that. And like you were mm -hmm. saying, it's amazing what goes into creating a concert series, getting funding for that concert. And, and any arts organization, even the biggest ones, but especially anything that's a, a notch down from those top five groups, um, they're, they're a bad month away from 
bankruptcy. I mean, really, it's a ama- it's, it's, it's a reality. It very yeah. well could be the case with a lot of these organizations. Absolutely, yeah. And it's and it's so much a combination the the business side of it, the marketing side, the the development, the fundraising. It's such a fascinating and complex mix of art and science. I mean, there's so much art Absolutely. To, to that too. There's um, so much creative energy on the business side of things. Absolutely. There has to be, there absolutely yeah. has to be. Yeah. Um, so I love to hear a little bit about, so you, you, you're working for this company and you end up being on your own, striking on your own, doing your own thing. And Sure. Not too long ago, you got the idea to launch this site, the Musician's Guide to Hustling, and maybe just right. talk talk about what inspired that that project, that site. Yeah, so the the what inspired the site is the exact same thing that inspired uh, my book, Breaking into the Scene, mm-hmm. that just came out. It's basically I wanted to create, a, I wanted to basically create the resource that I wish I had access to four years ago, five years ago. And so like, I'm a young guy for anybody listening. I'm a, I'm, I'm a relatively recent music school graduate. And the biggest challenge I found is that there's a lot of great books on this topic out there. Not a lot, but there are some great books on this topic out there. I mean, things like David Cutler, Savvy Musician is a great read. Angela Beeching's Beyond Talent. Um, there's a few, and there's a, there's a few others that are really quite good. Musician's Way by, um, Clifton Stein, I yeah, think is his name. Gerald, yeah. Um, and so there's some there's some great resources out there, but one thing that I found to be um, kind of challenging was that there's there's a little bit of an information gap between what's out there in a lot of these courses and books and things, and being someone that has like that is like an individual person that is sitting there like, all right, I have this creative skill set. I have like I can play the bass. I can play the French horn. I can you know I can arrange this piece for a string quartet for a wedding like so but then the question is how do i get started monetizing that mm-hmm. how do i start actually earning money with this skill that i develop because the reality for a lot of people is you know there's there's like kind of the traditional path that everybody knows about but the thing that a lot of people especially young students i've found just they're not running as a you know as being one not that long ago and just talking and hearing from them all over the world, literally all over the world. It's crazy. But is that they're, they don't know how to take the first steps. How do you actually get started? So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to basically break down the process of how to take, you know, not like I'm not talking about, there's plenty of books out there that are like, you know, here's how to earn six figures doing what you love, you know, follow your passion, that kind of stuff. And I wanted to basically create an actionable step-by-step guide that people could follow. So that's what that's how the site started. It's Musician's Guide to Hustling dot com, and um, and it's resonated really strikingly well with uh, my target audience, which is you know relatively young musicians, or it's not necessarily specific to young musicians, but that's who I know needs the most help. Mm -hmm. So that's what really inspired starting the site and writing break into the scene um, was just kind of how can someone go from it's like there's a really popular book in the entrepreneur world uh, called Zero to One by Peter Thiel, who was like he was like one of the founders of PayPal. And he was like the first big investor in Facebook. I mean, this guy's like a, a rock star entrepreneur. And the whole premise of the book is like, how do you go from zero to one? How do you get those first wins to validate your whether it's a, a new business venture or just am what am I do, what I'm doing is it working? Like, can I actually get paid to utilize this skill set? How do I monetize this and start earning money? It's not about the book is not about the book and the site are not about here's how to launch a full time career as a freelancer because the reality is is very few people want to be full time freelancers. Some people do. I hear from them. That's, that's awesome. That's great. Some people are you know, working. They have like a couple regional orchestras they play with regularly, and they just want to like supplement their income. Maybe they've got an audition coming up, and they want to earn some extra money to pay for the flight. Maybe they have a you know maybe they're a band director or an orchestra director in, a, in like a school or high school or elementary school, and they want to pick up some students on the side. Like I want to be able to help people 
you know, I want to basically equip them with the skill set to go as far into this as they want to go. Like, Mm -hmm. it's not about like being a full time freelancer. Like, the site's not about that. The book isn't about that. It's more about how can I like develop the skill set so that whenever I want to do something, whenever I want to pick up some gigs, I, you know, I've got an expense coming up next year. I want to take a trip. Why not? Great. Go for it. Here's how you can like, start implementing these here are some like concepts and principles and strategies you can use to actually start earning money mm-hmm. that whether it's additional money or your first gigs ever that's really the goal and inspiration of the site um, as well as the book well let's take just as a as an example uh, i did a survey recently on the, the folks that listen to the podcast and mm-hmm. a lot of people that are about say 24 and they're mm-hmm. finishing their master's Yep, in that's exactly the, that's like smack in the middle of who I'm trying to reach yeah. is the people that are like, all right, I've I don't want to say I've been hiding in school, but uh-huh. I've been in school and I haven't actually had to like do this yet. <laughs> uh-huh. So so let's so they're all listening with rapt attention right now. To, all right, to, and they're wondering, Seth, what on earth do I do? The loans okay. are coming. The yep. white calendars days, the weeks, months are <laughs> the just about to hit. <laughs> the calendar is white. Blank. <laughs> yeah. What, what on earth? I don't even know where to begin. What do I do? Okay. So if you are someone right now that's listening, so whether you're someone implementing this yourself or you're a teacher that has students that are doing this, here's exactly what I would do. If, and I am absolutely confident that if I talk to any one person right now, anywhere in the country, I could probably figure out how to get them at least one gig in very short amount of time. So here's exactly what I would do. First off, if you are someone that's like getting started, look at who you know in the scene that's actually doing work, that's actually working for the local orchestras. They're, maybe they're Maybe they're playing in a... There's a there's like a wedding band or something they play in whatever it is if there, maybe there, maybe you're a jazz bass player whatever it is look at who you know that's actually working and the first thing that you should do is reach out to them and say hey come with complete no ego and just say listen I'm getting started I'm trying to get going I have no idea what to do if that's true tell them don't try to like sugarcoat or anything just be like hey I'm trying to get going. I'm just finishing up school. I've been doing some work around town, some random gigs. I would love to get your thoughts or advice about who I could reach out to. Everybody has, and this is something I talk about in the book, is like everybody has everything they need to get started. Mm -hmm. The most obvious and important thing is you have a natural network. You have people that you just naturally know. And the first thing you need to do is start reaching out to those people and just and just kind of like this is another thing I talk about is like it's all about a soft sell. You're not trying to say like, hey, you should hire me right now. And it's striking how many people do not have the social intelligence to understand that. But it's just saying like, <laughs> which is crazy. But it's just going to the people and say, hey, if you have any thoughts or recommendations of people I should reach out to, you know, are there any are there any places that I should be like playing for? Find the people that are playing, and if that means taking a lesson with them go take a lesson with them and just say, hey, I'd love to play for you. And if you don't mind, it would be really great if I could just pick your brain a little bit. If that means you pay them for their time and you go and like take a lesson and you pay them, there's, you know, $100 for an hour or 70 bucks or 150, whatever it is. It's so worth doing because you're investing in getting the knowledge that you can then leverage into opportunities later. You're developing like, an understanding of the of the playing field. That's the first thing you should do. Reach out to the people and ask for help. It's so simple. Anybody could do it. And people, if you go to them in the right way, they want to see you succeed. People want to help. Musicians get it. Like if Jason, if somebody emailed you right now, they just they're just graduating from Chicago, they're just graduating from, I don't know, Northwestern or DePaul mm-hmm. or whatever. And they're like, Hey man, I, you know, I'm trying to get started. I just finished school. Would you mind like, you know, would you mind like if I took a lesson from you and could just pick your brain a little bit? 
I, I used do you to, understand where they're coming from? Oh, I absolutely do. In fact, I used to have an email template that I would use for people who contact me like that, full of helpful information of, sure, let's get, let's get in touch. Let's find some time. Additionally, you should get in touch with this person and this person. Right. I'd recommend you do this and this um, b- because that, yeah, it's – the that the vast majority of people out there, the, the, or at least the mentally stable ones, are uh, are, <laughs> are eager and willing to help because they understand and they want. And so here's a, another another question, or maybe something we could. So I'm one of these. Let's pretend I'm one of these 24 year olds listening, and I'm yep. I'm I've I've figured out who to reach. I figured out who to get in touch with. So I sit down and I start writing my email. And I'm 12 paragraphs deep into that email. I'm telling them everything about my life story. I'm telling them my my biography and minute detail. Every ensemble I played with at school, contemporary music ensemble, jazz band B, I'm giving them all the information. I've got this giant paragraph after paragraph word bomb, and I... And I'm right. about to press send. Am I am I approaching this the right A word way? Bomb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that you're approaching it the right way, but you want to make sure when you're reaching out to people um, that the fir- the first and foremost thing you need to consider is that you're asking them to do you a favor. Mm-hmm essentially is what you're doing. And so you have to angle, you have to go about this from a way that's very, very respectful of their time. I, you know, it's funny you mentioned this. I have an email script that I'm sure you've seen, Jason, that I recommend everybody check out. So if you want to learn more about this, go to breakintothescene.com and there will be a place where you can sign up, um, uh, where you can download this script as part of just, it's for you. It's completely free. You can copy and paste this. I, and I'll tell you a, a story of someone that used this script really well in a minute. But like, um, it's it's all about being respectful of their time, though. So you want to keep it very short, concise, and you want to make it easy for them to say yes. Mm-hmm. Whenever someone emails me, and I get these emails all the effing time, and they they send me like it's literally like a thousand words in just a block form. And it's like, there's no way I'm going to read all of this. It's so difficult to read and digest what they're asking. It's so that's the first thing I would say. And like, there, there are really five sentences. First, you just want to say like a quick introduction, like, Hey, like, you know, this is who I am. Then just make a simple ask. Just be like, you know, would you be interested in like, if I could take a lesson from you or, or maybe you did your homework on them, which you absolutely should. And you say, hey, I know you're playing like, let's say you live in like New York or something and you know they play on a Broadway show and say, hey, I know you've got like, I know you're on this show and that you guys have shows on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Would you be would you be interested and available if I like, you know, could get a lesson with you or maybe grab a drink or a, you know, buy you a cup of coffee or something? I know you're, you know, it's like, you know, they're going to be at that at that at that theater at 4 p.m. It's like. Would wins with Thursday at three at you know two o'clock three o'clock would that work for you? I mean I you know if if it's if not like what would be a good time? And then just say I've played with X Y Z ensembles in town. So, you know do you know someone that recommended you? Say like Jason recommended that I reach out to you. Seth recommended I reach out to you. Thanks so much for your time, and you know I hope to hear from you soon. Mm-hmm. It's like five sentences make it super easy for them to say yes. And you can get this exact script. You can literally copy and paste it. Um, it's good. You just go to break the scene.com. You can download it there, but you get the exact script and that you can just copy and paste and use. And like, you know, it's similar to what you were saying. It's going to save you a lot of time. Like you had something, Jason, that you were responding to people. Like you just had a stock response. You would send them. Mm-hmm. And it was probably really helpful for them and you, because it saved you a ton of time mm-hmm. and it, and it brought value to those, those people. And like, they probably were like that guy, Jason, he was, he really helped me out when I got started in three years when they're really dogging it, they could probably pass you some work back. Yeah. Um, yeah. so that's what I would say about that is like, keep it so simple, make it really easy for them to say yes. And just one quick story of someone that actually used this template. Um, there's a reader on my site where that I got an email from them. So I, I, 
I have this template I use. People, people that have been to my site and read my stuff, they might even be familiar with it. But it's, but they emailed me and they were like, "Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I used your template, and in less than 24 hours, I made like eight new connections with people. I reached out to people. I actually got a response. I got offered a $1,200 gig, and I oh, and I got a potential new teaching opportunity." They did that. They probably spent like two hours one day just reaching out to people, saying hello, using this script, just being really simple. And this is like basic sales in a way. It's like it's a soft sell. It's like you can say no if you want. It's not a big deal. But if you, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts on X, Y, Z thing. And so they used this. They reached out to people they already knew. These weren't even people they were reaching out to like cold, which you, this script works for that too. I've used it many times. But they were reaching out to people they already knew, and in like a day, less than 24 hours, they had made 12, they had booked a $1,200 gig, which was probably, you know, like a, like a weekend show, like a series or something that was going on for a, maybe a theater or something. I don't even know what the gig was, but, and they made eight new connections. They had, you know, people that now knew who they are. Mm-hmm. That's a huge thing that a lot of people don't consider is that. If you don't, if people don't know who you are, they will never be able to hire you. Right. Yeah. Don't make an assumption that they know who you are just because you exist and you have a base in your closet. Like yeah. they don't, if they don't know who you are, they will never hire you period. So, and then, but then she also got a teaching opportunity as well, <laughs> which that, if she lands that opportunity, I don't know if she did, maybe I'll, I'll email her and ask her. I don't know. But like if she landed that opportunity and it turned into a private student, that's worth thousands and thousands of dollars every single year that she has that student. Yeah. That was from like three hours of work. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing how that just a little bit of targeted, targeted work and sitting down and doing that, just making a practice of that, that just the dividends right. that that can pay. Uh, and I love the, what you're talking about with the, just the simple, I'll, I'll definitely make sure that we link to that, to that, uh, sure. temp, you know, just so that people can find that template because uh, the the simple ask, the reach out, the simple ask, and just a little bit of what you call social proof. Like I've played with this and this. You don't have to give them eight paragraphs because I'll tell you, I get one of those long emails and I I respond to everything I get. But I have a special folder that the long emails go into when I have time <laughs> to process them. But if you send me a is the is the special folder your spam folder? Or? <laughs> it's it's called. My wife makes fun of me because I used to actually put her emails in there. I hope she's not listening. But it was what was called <laughs> is what was called my two process folder, which is really. A joke because it was essentially like a one step removed from my spam folder or my archive it's like (laughs) if i really had some time i'd open that up and go through but but it's a if the same exact person had emailed me and had been a simple ask like that if it's if it's something that takes me less than 30 seconds i'm probably likely to just deal with it or respond if it's something that's going to take 10 minutes or 20 minutes or something i have to set time aside that has to go on my to-do list right and i think that's the way it is for a lot of and it very well may never get done yes you know depending on who the person is and how busy they are if they're really like an actually busy freelancer that doesn't you know that that doesn't necessarily have time to read emails like that you will probably never get a response yeah. and you might meet them in a gig one day and you can be like hey sorry for that like really ranty email i sent you that was really embarrassing sorry about that <laughs> yeah yeah so let's talk about but like i mean it's just keeping it simple for them is so so important because the busier the person is the less likely they are to respond if it's a very very long even mm-hmm. if it's short a mm-hmm. lot of busy people just won't respond and that's okay yeah. If you send out 10 emails and get three responses, that's a huge win. That's yeah. three people that you did not know or have a connection to previously if you're reaching out to new people. Mm-hmm. And that's huge a huge win. That's such a great mindset for when you're when you're making contacts like that. A friend of mine talked about the act of collecting no's try to collect the no's you know right like, like just don't don't focus on the nine people that didn't email you back uh enjoy yeah, yeah. Yeah, enjoy don't worry the, about that enjoy the three new connections and yeah another kind of along a similar topic let's say, so you've started to build your network people are taking your advice and you, yeah. you get an email for a gig you can't do yeah what what's a way that I used to respond when I was younger was can't do it. Sorry. Or worse, I would not do this, but not respond. But, um, uh, 
how how might you use that opportunity that you can't do something to to uh, help help yourself sure. in this world? This is uh, most like young freelancer, especially is like worst nightmare when they get offered a gig and they need the gig and they can't do it. Like we all have that experience of where like it's like the middle of April. It's super busy. There are so many gigs flying around and you're trying to take as many as you can. And someone emails you about like a better gig, but you've already committed to something else. It's like everybody's worst nightmare. It's like, no, that's that's five hundred dollars I just lost. That's that's seven hundred dollars or three hundred dollars, whatever it is. Like we've all had that experience. So the what I would say that's actually a huge opportunity for you to connect with other people. So something that I do, and I talk about this in the book, is that. Using that as like an opportunity is like something people don't really look at it that way. They look at it as like, ah, crap, I can't do it. Like, and then they're just like, sorry, and they, I can't do it, but maybe, maybe next time. But what, but put what I do and what I would highly recommend other people do, and it's a great way to meet people without even meeting them, is say, hey, thanks so much for contacting me. I really appreciate it. In case you need other people, here are, you know, five other people that I would highly recommend. They would be great for this. Uh, you know, Hopefully, hopefully one of these people can do it. Thanks so much. I look, you know, hopefully we can work together in the future. Done. Send it off again. It's like five sentences. Mm -hmm. And, but what you're really doing there is two things. You're adding value, which is a huge, you'll, if, if anybody that reads this book will literally read that phrase like a hundred times, it's so important. It's so, so important. I can't stress it enough. But you're adding value to the contractor because you're helping them do their job. Yeah. Anybody that's ever done contracting work, knows it, it can be such a pain when you reach out to people and they don't respond for a week or you can't find people or they never respond at all. And But if you reach out to them and say, hey, I can't do the gig, but here are five people, you're saving them the time. If they're really looking for a person and you help them find someone, they will absolutely remember you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And not only will you be doing them a favor and they might call you for the next gig, but the person they hire, you're doing them a favor too by referring them to a gig because the best way, this is absolutely the best way. I remember someone at, um, I think it was Eric Schweinger, who's a trumpet player in Philadelphia. He's at Temple University. Uh, he subs with the orchestra a lot and big, you know, very, very busy freelancer. Very, like, very, um, you know, he's, someone that's helped me a lot. And Eric told me, he was like, you know, the best way that you can like start meeting people hands down is to pass them a gig. Yeah. If you want to connect with someone that's real, that's like really busy and probably not going to like pass you a gig if they don't know you, uh, probably, cause they probably don't know you. They don't trust. They may not have a trust in you yet because when you refer someone like you want to refer people that are better than you because then they will be, cause then, you know, reciprocation, is really what's happening there. Mm -hmm. People feel like there's almost this like psychological tick in the human mind of like, we want to return the favor to people when they help us out. You know, so if someone recommends me for a gig, I, that leaves a great taste in my mouth about them and I want to help them out too. And it introduces you in a really great way. And at the same time, you're helping out the contractor. So you're helping two people in a situation that could very easily be something where it's like, uh, I guess I guess I can't do that gig, you know. Ah, you know, yeah. shucks. And it's it's a great way to it's a great way to kind of like turn what would be what would usually be seen as like a negative thing into an opportunity for yourself and to other people. Right. And the the music world, no matter where you live, is a small world. And, and very these very are, small. These are relationships that are likely, if you're there for any length of time, to be going on for years. So this Absolutely. is like the one small moment in a very long uh, relationship. And I, I I remember so clearly when I would pass gigs along to people. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think is easy to to forget, but I. I remember getting emails. Hey, thank you for passing my name along. And it wasn't until later in my career that when I started to get gigs passed, hey, Tim recommended you, I, I started mm -hmm. to make a practice of just reaching out to that person and say, hey, thanks, and sort of like strengthening Absolutely. that relationship. And I'll tell you, like my, the experiences I've had contracting 
hiring hiring people, especially for educational things, hiring them for solo mm-hmm. and ensemble or hiring them yeah, as absolutely. private teachers. I'll tell you, the person that responded immediately and even if they couldn't do it, that they were my first call the next year because they made absolutely. my life easier. Because we, we yeah, absolutely, in, yeah, that's all anybody wants. Yeah. They want their lives to be easier, especially mm-hmm. when it's something like, like you know, hiring people is not as like glorious as it might sound. <laughs> like being because everybody's like, oh my god, if you're the contractor, like you get to do all the hiring and you can hire the other contractors and things. Which yeah, that's true. You can do that, and it's a great way to meet people. But it's a lot of work and it can be yeah. really frustrating work. Yeah. So like anybody that's ever done it, like until you, you know, will can tell you like it can be very time consuming. And right. if you can save that person time, do it. Absolutely do it. They will thank you. It, that, that is such a great point. I mean, I just think like of all the tasks that I like from most to least, you know, like going for a hike with my wife, this or that. And then we get to like practicing the base, that kind of thing. And then it's like, invoicing and hiring yeah. people are like some of the i never sit down and it's like yes let's fill out some invoice or let's yes. make thank a god whole... i get to fill out this invoice yeah <laughs> or like let's look at these dates and send these emails with all these dates and kind of keep track of who i reached out yeah. to and any... let me let me go babysit 50 musicians doesn't that sound fun like <laughs> <laughs> well that's something that when i interviewed brett and Ed- edmondson for the podcast because mm-hmm. he did some he did some contracting and boy yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Anything. And this also ties into the I appreciate it. How can I help? You you would not believe, or maybe you would if you're listening, but you might not be aware of just just how rough a job that can be. And it can be brutal. Un- it can underappreciated be and anything you can do to make that person's life easier. And it's everything that Seth and I've been talking about. It's just it it is you you it can be such a massive positive. So like those these are important important topics we're hitting on absolutely absolutely and and another thing that like just this one last little like tag on this uh is that you also have to look at this from the perspective of even if like a person can't necessarily recommend you for like to work with that orchestra they probably do work with other ensembles too Mm -hmm. and one thing that i will say and you can you've probably had this experience as well jason is that like contractors ask each other who they should hire. Yeah. If I'm looking for people to hire and I don't, I do not want to hire someone that's going to make more work for me. Mm-hmm. If you get hired for something and you start asking dumb questions, like things you could look up yourself or you didn't read the email. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that drives people crazy, including myself. But if you can just like, remember that even if those people that are doing the hiring, even if you can't do something with them at that organization or that orchestra, People that are doing work, a lot of work around town, they probably have their hands in this organization and some teaching work and, you know, other things that you would not even know. So, like, don't don't like, you know, keep an open mind and just understand that, like, there are many, many forms of opportunities and where they can come from. So, like, any way you can add value to the people around you and be useful is going to be very, very good for you in the long run. Maybe it takes a month to pan out. Maybe it takes three years to pan out. You never know. But it's, if, if you walk around leaving a, a trail of breadcrumbs of being positive and useful and valuable to other people and like people, a colleague people want to have, you'll do A-OK in the freelance game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it's interesting that the f- People listening might think, "Oh, I'm not. I'm not going to end up being a freelancer." I bet, but the, in you, you likely are. Even if you land a full time job, which, which, if you do any sort of reading or look at trends, you know the the trend in all forms of employment is towards what you call like a portfolio life or a freelance Absolutely. life. And yeah, that's and, what Garrett Hope talks about a lot on the Portfolio Composer podcast. Is the exact same thing. Absolutely, and I look at some of the people I know from the Chicago symphony, you think, Oh, that's one of the best jobs in the, in the yeah, nation. They're making, they're making like the, that's like the highest earning musicians around is like, it's like up there and right. they're still doing stuff. They're, on the side. they're doing. And some of the things that they're most passionate about, not that they're not passionate about playing in the Chicago symphony, but are those projects are those. Fr- and, and so I think that's likely to be a part of your life, if not your entire, the entirety of your life. And if you, 
if you approach it kind of like the way Seth and I are talking about, it can it can be an incredibly satisfying. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it's something that might be kind of interesting because you've done so many things. And Brent and I kind of talked about this, too. And when, when Brent and I were talking, uh, I, I kept on hitting on how some of these quote unquote side projects he did, he's been working on might actually be more artistically satisfying than some of what you would think of as traditional work. Like, for example, he's been editing Hal Robinson, principal base of Philadelphia, mm-hmm. yeah, his, yeah. his books of excerpts and putting that together. Absolutely. And how cool that role really is. And maybe it'd be interesting to just sort of explore. I think people listening that teaching gigging, those are two kind of understandable things. What are some other things you could be doing in the music world that, that fall under the umbrella of freelancing or being a portfolio musician? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so like, I mean, my career is a great example of this, I think. And as is yours, where, I think a lot of people, I mean, this is kind of, I can't remember if I, if, if we touched on this earlier or not, but like, you know, this idea of like music, it's like, I'm either an all or nothing bass player. It's like, Mm -hmm. if I'm not just playing, if I'm not playing bass full time all the time, they're like, I'm not a real bass player, a horn player, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a really valuable thing to consider. And there are a lot of different like ways you can diversify what you're doing. I mean, like, so for me, that's doing marketing work. I have this website that I run, um, I just wrote a book, for example. Mm-hmm. I never thought I'd write a book. Like that's mm-hmm. that's crazy to me. I still don't consider myself like a writer, even though it's like I do write regularly, and I now I now I'm an author, um, <laughs> and which it's like sounds so weird to say, but like so other things people could be doing. I mean, there are a ton of things, yeah. and I talk about I talk a lot about this in the book of like, I mean, you could be, and actually before I get into this, I should say that like the thing that a lot of people should keep in mind is like the things that you're interested in and like the kind of thing, like the little projects, little side projects you work on on a Saturday afternoon when you don't have like something to do, like maybe you're running a podcast, for example, mm-hmm. or maybe you're, you know, just recording, writing, you know, you're a singer songwriter writing things, or maybe you just enjoy arranging stuff in finale or Sibelius. All of those things could be turned into you know, like income, if you know how to do it right, and you're good at it, and you're actually able to do that. So I mean, just I can just give a couple of examples from my own life and some examples I've seen other people do. Um, Some of these don't have anything to do with freelance, yeah, being like, or not even freelancing, but just being musicians, like Mm -hmm. some of these aren't even necessarily musical skills. But like, so I do marketing work, obviously, I do a lot of web design, I have built sites for people for members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, or you know, I've done sites like huge projects for like publishing companies with huge book catalogs. And, you know, I, I just I did a site for someone that's uh, in the New York Philharmonic. I did a site for, um, you know, just I've done sites for authors. I've done all of this kind of stuff, um, which has led into me doing like working with um, other authors once in a while on things like that has nothing to do with music. But like now I, I, I help people do like book marketing stuff once in a while. I help them market their books. Um I've seen people that just all they do is they input parts for people that handwrite music. Mm-hmm. I know people that do that. I had I mean, one time my teacher and the uh, uh, Jeff Lang, who's a uh, associate principal horn in the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, like Jeff runs the like praise band or the church or used to run the, like the church band or something. And so like, you know, like all these little church groups, it's like, all right, we've got a kid that just started the clarinet. So we got to write a part for him. And we've got like two guitar players and there's a trombone and a saxophone and a, someone has a sousaphone. Like, let's bring that to church. Why not? You know, whatever it is. And so like, I remember one time I did a project for Jeff because I used to do a lot of arranging and stuff in finale. He was like, I have all this music that's like handwritten, it's chicken scratch. I've got these parts. I've got scores. I need to make parts out of them and transpose them for different instruments. Can you do that? And I was like, absolutely. And, you know, he paid me to do that. Um, it could be anything. You could, I mean, you could be, and maybe you're a good editor. I mean, I, when I was doing beta readers for my book, so I emailed my list and I just said, hey guys, would anybody be interested in, being a beta reader for my book. I just need editing feedback and I will give you an acknowledgement and shout out in the book. So I have like 50 people or some some crazy number that were 
provided some of them provided really good feedback. They were great yeah. editors. Mm-hmm. And you could be a book editor. Do you know how many orchestras out there have print are printing books every single weekend that don't have a proof a designated proofreader? If you went to them and said, Hey, like I can write copy or I can edit copy and I can write content and like edit your books and things, like you could probably very easily, this would not be that difficult because no, not many people are doing it. You could probably be one of the people that is going through and editing a book. Like, are they using the right titles for symphonies? If the person doing the book is not a musician, they may not realize they're doing it wrong. Or if they're, if they're you know, using the wrong, like, um, styling for how they refer to the pieces and the composers and, you know, what what opus number is this? You know, like, that kind of stuff. Like, if you're someone that knows music, and has another skill, you can find where those two meet and you can like turn that into like some freelance work. I mean, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, one of my favorite like entrepreneur, like hustling businessmen that I follow who has a great, great podcast called the ask Gary V show. It's a YouTube show as well. Um, and one of the things that he talks about is like, he calls it the inflection point. I've written about this on my site where it's basically like, where does your talent meet like where does like what you're good at your talent meet your interests and for some people like i always think about it as like two circles like you know you have your talent over here what you're good at and your interests and some people they overlap more than others you know there are people out there that they love playing the violin and they happen to be really amazing at it so they're like their two circles are basically smack on top of each other but if you are someone that's like just trying to put together some work and like maybe you're not the most amazing bass player in the world i'm not the most amazing horn player in the world far from it far from it but i have all these other interests and things that i've been able to use to kind of help build a career so like i was good at marketing but i also know a ton about the music business because i've worked in it now on both sides of the fence for years so i get hired by organizations all the time to do arts marketing and pr work for them all the time. I've done work for, I mean, I even did work for the Canadian Brass's record label a couple of months earlier this year. Um, and like, I never thought I'd be doing that kind of stuff. Like the Canadian Brass's record label, like really, they call me to like help them do work. Like how crazy is that to think about? Like I would have never thought that was a thing. And, but you know, it's like, you never know what these opportunities could be, but if you just follow like what you're interested in, like you know, the skills you have and find where they meet, you can probably drum up some freelance work out of doing that. Well, I love how going back to what we were talking about earlier, so much of that can be traced to you working in a parking garage and just being tenacious with this one person yeah. and having that, you know, so you do. <laughs> oh, right. And, and that's, and that's another thing that, I mean, again, this is something I talk about in the book. I call I mean, this is, I call it the opportunity mindset. People will have a million, there's a million things you could refer to this as people talk about it all the time, but, I am a big believer that opportunity is out there. Mm -hmm. It exists. It's around. And it's up to you to look at it through the lens of how you can kind of create those for yourself and take advantage of opportunities that are there. Who would have thought that working in a parking garage in Center City, Philadelphia would lead to me getting my first job in marketing, which ended up being how I... I get to work from home every single day. I can take trips when I want to. I can go work from a coffee shop. I can take my dog to the dog park at 11 a.m. I, you know, I can do all of this stuff. I have like almost infinite flexibility in my schedule. Mm-hmm. And it's because all of that stemmed from me taking, seeing an advantage to like learn from a guy that parked his car in the garage I worked at. Like yeah. that's pretty wild. Um, and I just always think like, I look at everything around me as like, as you know, how could this be an opportunity to learn, to grow, to engage with a new topic or something? So, I mean, you know, the way I do this, this is different for everybody. Uh, I'm a huge reader. I read a ton. I listen to a lot of audio books when I walk. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I work with business coaches. I had a writing coach I've been working with for my book. Um, so, like, I just find things I'm interested in. And then I just kind of follow the path and see what I can see what I can do with it. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of that's very much kind of my approach to it is like looking at everything as an opportunity. And sometimes it's not at all. And it crashes and burns. And it was a, and it was a you know, it just didn't it didn't pan out to be anything. And that's OK. That's going to happen. But like, who cares? 
I, I always, you know, I try to learn something from everything that happens to me, whether it's good or bad. There's always something to learn. And that's like a lesson that I take with me everywhere I go. And I, and I hope other people will as well, because it's, it's definitely been a game changer in like my professional career and helped me kind of like, you know, and I'm a young guy, but like, it's very, help, it's helped me kind of get where I want to be um, a heck of a lot faster than a lot of other people, you know, that are kind of stuck looking at things as problems and not looking at things and not looking at it as like they folk people a lot of, I think it's easy to focus on like the challenges and the frustrations and the problems of things. Um, and I'm more interested in focusing on creating solutions to the problems that I care about. Yeah. It's such a, such a great, you know, like an abundance mindset kind of, kind of versus a scarcity mindset. Just looking at things. I love that. I love the way you put that. Looking at things as an opportunity, not focusing on problems. And it's such a great, right. because there it's that, that's such a valuable lesson. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to dig into the topic and again, kind of rewinding back to like talking about someone who's early on in their career, they're getting out of music school mm -hmm. and they think I need to, I'm going to start doing my thing. All right. Time to build a website. That's what I'm going right. to do. I'm going to build a website. Good first move. Um, I wouldn't say that it's, it's not a bad first move, but sure. I don't think it's the first thing people should focus on. Yeah. Um, the thing that the thing that I really encourage people, and there's a section in the book where I talk about like you are like you know, things you don't need, yeah. and and there are things that traditionally people interpret as like it's a great idea to go and get like. I'm going to go design business cards and I'm going to set up my social media channels and I'm going to build a website. And all of those things can be extremely effective if you know how to use them. But if you're just starting out, you should focus on getting your first wins. Like how can you get like hired for a gig in like a month? Like where can you go? Reach out to the people like we talked about, use the script that you'll find at breaking the scene.com and focus there because whenever you whenever people start and like I've done this whenever I do talks about this stuff once in a while I always give the example of the very first time that I like really um like I've always been a starter with things I I get excited about an idea and I just do it I don't think about if it's right or wrong I just you know I just try to just try it out try to like the what uh this is what Eric Rees who wrote the um the lean startup would call like the MVP the minimum viable product and I just get what I need to do to get started and I go and figure it out as I figure it out as I go. But like the thing that a lot of people focus on is they focus on these like kind of traditional things like websites. And the reality is that it's not likely that building a website is going to immediately lead to you getting work. Um, and anybody with a website can that's ever looked at analytics can tell you that if you're a personal individual musician that knows nothing about internet marketing or digital marketing or driving traffic to a website, you were probably going to get like five visits a month. Four of them are going to be you checking in, and the other the other three are going or the other the other one's going to be your mom like looking at it, like showing her friends at church that her son or daughter has a website, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's so like a lot of people will disagree with me on this. They're like, you have to have a website, but. I, the thing that I would challenge people with that is like, if you're just starting out, you have to have a product before you can market it. Yeah. Like you have to have a product to market before you're actually doing it. So focusing on getting to know the people and, and like doing really authentic network, networking, like building connections with people in your area and getting help from people like finding mentors and things, um, will be very, very, um, effective in getting you going but things like websites and business cards um you know seth godin would kind of label this as he's a big marketing guru guy which a lot of people are familiar with great great books uh he's got like 18 best-selling books or something crazy like it's really wild and so but he would talk about how like it's there it's like, it's like very easy to hide right it's easy to feel like you're being productive whenever you're like going on vistaprint or moo.com and ordering business cards it's easy to feel productive when you're like building a website but not actually putting yourself out there to go get rejected it's very easy to kind of like hide in your bedroom and do these things and tell yourself you're being productive 
And again, this is not to say that you're not being productive by doing that, but if the goal is to start generating income for yourself, whether it's more income or any income, wherever you're starting, you need to you need to focus on the things that are actually going to get you immediate results. Like mm-hmm. and a personal example of this, I was building websites for people for almost 2 years and I like some of these were pretty big projects and I didn't have a personal website myself. People were paying me a good amount of money to build websites for them. I mean, there were projects that were, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars that I was doing, and I had people helping me with them, and I would hire, I would hire help when I needed it. And I didn't even have a website myself. It's a good, good lesson to, good lesson to take heed of. And, and <laughs> all of that, all of that, and people are like, "Well, where did that work come from?" Well, it came from having having good relationships with the people around me that I could add value to so that whenever there was an opportunity where I could be useful to them, I was the first person they think of. Like, you know, like in the, in the world of marketing, like you need to know, you know, Austin Kleon would call this, he wrote a fantastic book called Show Your Work. I highly recommend it to anybody out there. It's a short read. He's an artist that totally gets it. And the book is phenomenal. But he has a section where he, where he calls... Um, he calls it find your fellow knuckleballers. Identify <laughs> the other people in your space that are doing similar things. If you're a young student trying to get going, reach out to the other young the, reach out to the people that graduated from your school that are freelancing in town 2 years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't don't shoot for the top immediately because it's going to be hard to get up there, but find people that are your, you know, what Austin Cleon would call your knuckleballers. So for me in doing marketing work, web design work, I would literally, there were people that I worked with that were contractors with the organization I worked for, and they were like consultants. So they were publicists, they were marketers themselves. And so people know, people know that they are sources of good information for these topics. So whenever a publicist gets a client that needs a website, they're like, oh, you know, talk to this guy, Seth. He might be a good fit for you. And that's how I would get work. I never had a website. A website, I can think of like one time ever that I had a website exit that got that was out there somebody just stumbled upon it and I got a gig out of it I can think of one time ever that where like it was like dumb luck that happened even the people that even the people that come through my website right now that hire me to build them websites or for, or for consulting work they come from people that say, oh, talk to this guy, Seth. Here's his website. So they're, they're still being referred to me by other people. They just so happen the, – the website is now just the funnel that sends them to me. Yeah. So like it's not that the website itself is like random people are stumbling on it like, oh, my God, this guy, he has to do my work. But it's that I, I have good relationships with people that I try to help as much as I can because they help me out. It's you know, you scratch your back, I'll scratch mine, and we can help each other out here. Um, so that's, that's what I would say about websites. It's, they're very practical to have. I mean, you know, my site now and your site for you, Jason, or other people, like if you've got a product that you're out there building, like, um, there is, and there's like, you're generating content around this stuff. Like if it's a podcast or like my blog gets, I, it's so wild. You probably have the same experience of like, I get emails from people. Like I literally got an email recently from a guy who's a choir director in Nigeria. Like what? (laughs) That's so crazy. There's a dude in Nigeria that's reading my stuff and like, and like, and it was was like, you know, it made it it like resonate enough with him that he wanted to like be a beta reader for my book and actually, and like email me after I sent out a list, a list, um, an email to my list about it. And he like personally reached out and was, and sent me a separate email. and was like, Hey, you know, I saw your email about this. I'm a choir director in Nigeria. I, it's like the capital city. And this, like, we do this choir stuff. And it's like, I don't know anything about Nigeria, obviously, but like, but this guy was like, he was just like, you know, I love your stuff. I would love to like, you know, help out in any way I can. And that comes from, but like that only works whenever you're consistently content, like generating content and things that are valuable to the people, to your target audience, which um, we could talk about that too. But, well, you that, know, that, like, yeah. No, no, I love I just to hit on what you're talking about, that I, I love that. And that's where you get the interactions, just like you're saying, like producing content. I, but like what Seth was saying, like if you're looking to get started, the content kind of thing is something that pays off 
in a year. The mm-hmm. the the emails and emailing the people in in your network and making those contacts those are the things that'll pay off that day or in that yeah week, so. that like that you could be sitting down with them having a cup of coffee in tomorrow yeah right right and that could lead to an opportunity whether it's a, whether, if you're just starting out like if you just finish your master's degree you ain't too good for an internship somewhere <laughs> where you can learn a lot seriously <laughs> and if that but if that's what it is and someone offers like hey we could use some help around the office. But you'll get to meet people. You'll get to like learn more about what it is we do and how we and how the people make money from doing this. Like those those are the kind of things that will come very quickly by like you were saying, emailing people, reaching out into your network, and just mm-hmm. saying like, hey, you know, what? I'm trying to do X Y Z thing. If you have any thoughts, feedback, advice, I'd love to hear it. Well, something and you just brought it up now, and I'd I'd love because this is something we probably both think about a lot. But let's just talk if if you don't mind about creating content that matters to people whether sure. that's you know what do you, <laughs> maybe just, i'll just put it out there generally like that do you have any 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 thoughts on that topic uh i have a lot of <laughs> thoughts on that topic so uh, well, the most important thing first off that anybody should do this is the marketing decision that nobody ever makes and it's and it's why mark it's why marketing is so hard um and it's something that a lot of people never even consider who is your audience? Who are the people you want to be reaching that what you do is meaningful to them? That is the first question you need to ask yourself. Who is the audience for what I'm trying to do? So like in your, in your case, Jason, it's bass players. That's a very niche thing. There's nobody else in the world that I know of that is consistently reaching out and engaging with this community with valuable content. I would venture to say that like, most professional bass players out there at least know of you like you know as being the guy from the double bass podcast who's been blogging for like 10 years about this topic so your audience you know who they are Mm -hmm. they and but and and as a result you are able to create content that is valuable to them because you've engaged directly because you're a bass player. You know what bass players care about. You know what they talk about at gigs, like whether they're talking about what kind of rosin they're using or like, you know, the best repair people or, you know, how to like play, how do you play this 32nd note in this excerpt of this Mendelssohn symphony? Like, how do you do that? And like, but you know what they're talking about. So you can engage with them in a meaningful way because you've identified who the audience actually is. So to give a couple of examples of this, you know, I'll actually, if you're a freelancer, you're an individual person that's like, maybe you're taking auditions, maybe you're teaching privately, all of these things that you're doing, all these different like avenues of what you have your income, all have their own separate buckets of customers. So if you're mm-hmm. a freelancer, your customers, if you're doing like orchestral work, are contractors. There's probably 10 people that are your real customers in your city. That's it. Focus on how you can create genuine relationships with them. It's probably not through a blog or a podcast, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is through reaching out to them like we were talking about. Uh, but if you're doing teaching, the the parents are your customer. How can you create content that's so stupidly valuable for the parents of students so that you stand out whenever they're looking for a base, you know, a base player to teach their students? What are the challenges that they care about? So if it's a young student just starting the base, your target a market is probably the mother of, band, of orchestra students yeah. and or father whoever makes the decision and drives them to soccer practice in their base and their base lessons, that's who you want to reach out to. So what are their problems? What is something that they don't know about? A friend of mine, her name's Kieran. She's a cellist in New York. And Kieran was at, we did an interview on, on my site and I don't know if it'll be up when this is, when this goes out or not, but her name's Kieran McKellen. So Kieran, we were talking about this. She kills it with private teaching. And the way she does it is she lives in Brooklyn where there's a lot of people looking for bass lessons. There's a lot of music students, but there are also a lot of people teaching. So how do you stand out? So Kieran is a cellist and every single person that emails her about lessons, she sends them like a little reference. She sends them like a little resource sheet like, hey, if, you're, if, you, if you need this stuff, 
here are the top three places that I recommend you go for instrument rentals. Here's what to look for. Don't look at this other stuff. They're going to try to sell you other things. Don't worry about that. Here's what you need to look for. And here are three tips of how to go about renting a cello. And here's what you need to buy. Here's what you need to look out for. If you're a parent that has no clue about the cello or the bass or the trombone or whatever it is, and someone that you're considering hiring to, to teach their student, their kid says, hey, you know what? I know that you're probably struggling with X, Y, Z thing, like that you may not, may not, maybe you, maybe you know what you're looking for, maybe you don't. But just in case, here's just three quick tips you can use to like know what to look for when you're renting a trombone. No, no musician out there is doing that much. There's like, there's probably less than 25 musicians, like, music teachers out there that are actually actively doing that. If you're a music, if you're trying to do private lessons, every single time you get a lead, if you give them something that valuable to them that could save them time, energy, money, these are the things people care about, you will stick out in their mind like a sore thumb yeah. because you engage with who your customer is in a way that's meaningful to them. This would take somebody that lives in like, you know, like some bass player in Chicago right now, probably knows where the stores are and the people that rent out student bases and get and gets a good deal, you know, and that would be a great play that, that that takes care of the like the students of their, you know, their friends that they send there. It probably it's so easy to find that out for us. We're musicians. We don't think about that as being a problem for someone else, but the customer does because they don't know. So that's an example of of way that like someone could add value and by understanding their target audience. And the last example I'll give here, if, if, I, if I have time for one more. Sure, sure. Oh, okay, so when I was writing this book, so the book is called Break Into the Scene, and I purposely disqualified readers, like customers, because I didn't want to focus, I wanted to focus on how younger musicians or people that are trying to either get started or do a little bit more, or maybe they're moving to a new city. Like Jason, you just moved to a new city. You have to like now meet people in a new city. So like I wanted to write a book specifically for those people. So in order to really do like thorough research and effective market research on this, I started a site called Musician's Guide to Hustling, which at the time I wasn't necessarily, excuse me, planning on writing a book, but I basically started figuring out, I started just talking to my friends who were my target audience. They're young musicians that are trying to like, they're just finishing up, they just finished their master's degree a few years ago, or they're finishing their DMA or whatever it is. They're auditioning. They're trying to make ends meet. What are their problems? How can I cater to what they need as, you know, as young musicians? I get it. I am a young musician. And I've been really fortunate to, you know, I've worked at this point, I've worked with like business coaches. I've taken high end like programs online to like learn to do this stuff really, really well. Um, And like I've been able to kind of build this stuff up just because I have it was something that I just like happened to be really interested in. So I started reaching out to people and just I'll talk to my friends say, hey, what is the biggest problem you have with freelancing? What are the biggest challenges you have? So people say things like, well, there aren't any opportunities out there. There are no new opportunities out there for me. You know, I don't know how to make the right connections with people. I don't know what, to, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know what to say. I don't know where to find them. And then the other thing is that people depend on, they, people assume that they're just going to get called. Mm-hmm. So whenever I was writing my book, I was like, all right, these are the things that I need to make sure I really focus on and that I not only address the issue, but give them actionable answers. That's why I write scripts that people can use. And I got, I've got, i gotten emails from people like you know, the person I talked about earlier that literally made $1,200 in a day by reaching out to people she already knew. And like, so I know that what I am doing, the, the work that I'm doing and creating content, because I've done, I've done, I know it's, it's correct and right on because I've talked to the people for over a year like a year and a half, I've had this site. I built an email list around it, and I ask them. I say, "Hey, what's your problem that you have with freelancing? What's the biggest challenge?" And it turns out that it's things like 
how do I reach out to people? I don't know what to say. I don't want to take their gigs. I don't know who the right people are to meet. I don't know how to create my own opportunities. And like, so that's exactly what I focus on in the book. I didn't focus on anything else. And, you know, and I got feedback from people like, oh, you should include this. You should include that. And I had to just say, you know what? No, I'm not going to include that because that's not what is important to my target audience who I want to reach and help. And so, because it's really a question of like, if you're, if you're a, like a young bass player right now or that's listening and you don't know how to like, you've gotten some gigs from people calling you, but you don't know how to go out there and get them yourself. The, you know, the goal of this book was really to take people from, how do you go from nothing, having knowing nothing to getting your first gig? Because if you can get one gig, you can get five gigs. Yeah. If you can get five, you can get 10. If you can get 10, you can get 25 and it will compound from there to 50 to a hundred. And you know, before you know it, if you're actively implementing the stuff in this book, you will be generating work for yourself. I, I know that if people read it and do the work and follow the advice, it's literally, I've lived it. I've had people all over the world read my stuff and send me emails about this stuff. I know it works. And the only reason that I got there is because what you originally asked with this long winded response is that, <laughs> is that, I understood who my customer is, who is, and people that hire you are your customers. That sounds like an icky word. Like people don't like thinking about like musicians hate the idea of like selling. Um, you're always selling yourself. You have to. You marketing, selling, freelancing. It's all about articulating the value of what you have to offer to the people that want your service, your product or service. That's all it is. And that starts with understanding your customer, who they are, and depending on how you want to reach them, if you're trying to build something online, whether it's a website or anything else, you need to create content that is relevant to that customer that will resonate with them. Not their friend, not their mom, not their teacher, them. It's not about reaching everybody. If you try to appeal to everybody, you will appeal to nobody. Even mega corporations like McDonald's and Starbucks and Chevy and Alibaba and Google, they have customers they want to reach. They reach millions and millions of people, billions of people, some of them. And even they, with this mass reach, maybe their niche is a little wider than yours is, but even they identify who their customer is and craft their message and their branding and how they communicate with their customers according to who they are, who is the customer, and what is it that they care about? How can I solve a problem for them? That's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. Love it. I love it. That's great. I, I love the, the, the that probably there aren't more than 25 people out there giving some kind of a tip sheet or a look at these five things for a parent. But think about what a value that is to a to a parent. Absolutely. Because just like you said, they're they're not living in this world. We are, and we have all this knowledge that we probably aren't even aware we have. And just finding Absolutely. a way to communicate that. And like you said, with the book and with other examples, narrowing down what you're trying to do. You're not trying to appeal to everybody. You just appeal to, mm -hmm. to nobody. Trying to figure that out, uh, it's just so valuable. Absolutely. Man. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's it, man. It's, it's all about identifying who it is that your customer is, whether they're a wedding, a, you know, the bride at a wedding, or a parent of a student or a contractor. Who are they? What do they care about? And how can you solve a problem for them? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Well, where can people find this new book and where can they find you online, Seth? Sure. So uh, probably the best place to learn about, you know, me at like this, all this freelancing business side of the music scene uh, content is musiciansguidetohustling.com. Um, if you want to learn about the book, it's available on Amazon in print or in Kindle. And that is, if you just search Break Into the Sea on Amazon, it'll pop right up. And the website for the book, if you want to learn more about it, if you want to check it out before you make a purchase, go to breakintothescene.com. Mm -hmm. And if you're inclined to want to learn more about the marketing stuff I do, that's just sethhaines.com. And anybody can feel free to send me an email. It's seth at sethhaines.com. And if you're a social media user, and you want to look at pictures of my dog at the dog park or 
or me at the me playing soccer with my friends or whatever it is, you can just follow me anywhere at Seth Haynes. It's just at Seth Haynes. Yeah. And, and folks sign up for Seth's email list, wherever you go. It's a great read full of what we're talking about right here. He does a excellent job with it and it's highly recommended. So no matter yeah. where you land, si- sign up for that. You won't be disappointed. Yeah. And one thing, just one thing to tag on that, Jason, you, um, that I should have mentioned a minute ago, I almost forgot is I, I have a free like marketing course for musicians that mm-hmm. I have on my site. If you just go to musicians, guide to hustling.com, It'll, there's a little landing page that'll come up. It's a five day course. It takes you through the entire process of concepts that you can apply in your own life about how to market more efficiently. It's totally free. It's, I've had, I think well over a thousand people go through the course at this point. It's, it's, uh, it's totally free. It's, it's all, it's all like told to the lens of like how to, how musicians can apply these concepts in their own life. Uh, it's completely free. So just go to musicians guide to hustling.com and you'll see, it. you can sign up for their for sign up for the course there. It's totally free. Um, and I hope you check it out. Cool. Thanks a lot, Seth. Pleasure. Jason, this was great, man. Thank you so much to you and uh, your listeners for having me on. This is really great. And I uh, look forward to chatting again soon with you. Yeah. Likewise. Thanks, Seth. So great to have you on the podcast. Folks, check them out. Breakintothescene.com is where you can find info about the book. You can also find it on Amazon. Search for Breaking to the Scene. Totally recommend this book. I got a lot out of it. I know you will, no matter where you are in your career. It's great advice. The sort of thing you'd give to a student, the sort of thing that you wish you had when you were 22, say. So that's another episode of Contrabase Conversations. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it so much. I know Seth does. We've got so much in store for you here. I don't even know where to begin. Coming up on a year, almost a year ago, I relaunched the podcast. And a lot has come out. In fact, this is episode 260. The first episode I put out was 161. That was Alex Hanna. So this is the 100th episode. Am I, is that the right math? Yes. This is the 100th episode <laughs> since uh, relaunching the podcast. And I just feel like these are getting better and better. I'm getting more comfortable doing this. I've embraced this role. I love doing this. I look forward to this so much. I'm so glad to have you here with me. Thank you, Diderio, for sponsoring these podcasts. It's companies like Diderio that are making me able to do more and more of this and take my time and invest it in creating content like this for you. So I'm so appreciative of that. And I'm so appreciative of you listening to this. This is a community podcast. This is for all of us in the base world. And I'm just having a blast as this, whatever it is I do, connector uh, between you and all these people in the music world. It's exciting times for sure. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.